to a program to a presentation on dreadful were the vestiges of war arms and battle damage from the first day of the american revolution we also welcome our fellow veterans who are viewing this program from the edith norse rogers memorial veterans hospital in bedford massachusetts it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker joel bowie Joel Bowie grew up in Concord, Massachusetts. He was infatuated with local history and he spent his free time in the library and roaming around historical sites, trying to find objects that might relate to the start of the American Revolution and then verifying them through research. He turned his passion into a career and he's the director of historic arms and Militaria for Bruno and Company Auctioneers. He is also an appraiser, and he appears regularly on the PBS Antiques Roadshow. Joel is keenly interested in musket ballistics, and he has done important battlefield archaeology work. In 2015, he began a collaboration with archaeologist Douglas Scott to understand more about the objects that were turning up on former battlegrounds. Using modern forensic techniques, Bowie and Scott have been able to determine what arms were used, who was doing the shooting, and basically what was going on. They wrote a book, and their book about the work on this project will be published at the end of this year. Is that about right? So, please welcome Joel Bowie, who has a lot to tell us in this perfect time of year, Patriots Day. Joel. So, uh, the book title, Dreadful Were the Vestiges of War, Bullet Strikes from the First Day of the American Revolution. Now, before, uh, a week or two ago, we didn't have our book cover, but it just came in, so I swapped it out for the slide that was there before. That's why it doesn't necessarily fit, um, but I wanted to share it. I think it came out really well. Um, as I mentioned, I grew up in Concord, spent a lot of time on the battlefield, and a lot of time in Lexington, and in 1973, um, I got hooked on the American Revolution. And my parents helped feed that, um, which I thought was great. Uh, for a time that, you know, Vietnam military stuff, you know, you guys know there was not a lot of uh, people who were wanted to do that type of thing, but my parents pushed it and I'm glad they did um, because I ended up spending a lot of time, this is me in Lexington in 1975 with Hal Hansen from our church who is now gone, a uh, member of the Lexington Midmen. Um, and then 1981, uh, this is me at the uh, uh, 200th anniversary of the Battle of Yorktown. Um, so it's, it's continued on for a very long time. And a lot of this stuff I'm going to talk about, the arms and everything, I hope it doesn't get too deep. I'm trying to, trying to make it interesting and not put you to sleep. So hopefully I can do that. But before we go too far, um, always have to do a little brief history. Obviously, you guys know a lot about it. Um, on the night of April 18th, 750 British troops um, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Smith um, were marching from, thank you, were marching uh, to Concord to destroy warlike stores that had been purchased by the Provincial Congress and were being stored there, amongst other towns. Um, early on, the word got out um, that the regulars were on the move and uh, the militia and minute companies from surrounding towns started to form. Um, as the British marched through Lexington at dawn, uh, they fire on the Lexington Militia, Captain Parker's company, uh, killing eight and wounding ten. Uh, and then they form up and they march towards Concord. Uh, the column arrived in Concord. They destroyed some of the warlike stores. The delay of the British leaving Lexington helped get more stores out of Concord and into the surrounding towns so they didn't get destroyed by the British. Um, at noon, the British leave Concord after the bridge, uh, the fight at the bridge and um, they get attacked at Marion's Corner and a thousand troops under Lord Percy show up in East Lexington right here right down the road um, and the fighting gets very heavy and that's where a lot of the battle damage is that we've we've found um, so how did the study begin I mean, it's kind of a weird study I'm sure people are like well what, 
made you spend all the time doing this. But it started during the Parker's Revenge Project. Um, over on the Lincoln-Lexington line, um, I was on the uh, advisory board with the Park Service, and when it came time to do the archaeological work, uh, the uh, Park Service said, no, you're not a professional archaeologist, you can't do it. Um, but then uh, came along Doug Scott, who is uh, to my left, your right, um, who is famous for his work at the Little Bighorn Battlefield. Uh, he had identified shell casings, firing pin impressions, using modern forensic techniques, and identified positions on the battlefield of Native Americans and troopers, which was fascinating work. And I remember reading his books and seeing him on TV and thinking, wow, really want to meet this guy. Well, I met him at Parker's Revenge, and uh, this is what started the project. And as we were digging up the musket balls, um, he said, you know, geez, it'd be really great to do a live fire study with muskets to better understand what happens to musket balls in different circumstances for archaeologists to use. But where are we going to get the guns? And it turned out I had been collecting custom-built uh, flintlocks, and I had 14. So I covered pretty much every um, gun from 1650 up through, well, I have up through the Civil War, but for flintlocks uh, up through the end of the war. So uh, after the Parker's Revenge project, um, I drove a carload of guns and metal detectors down to Georgia, and we did our first live fire test. Uh, we fired, this is myself firing a fouling piece. You can see a Doppler radar um, machine, the orange thing out there, which didn't work very well, well with uh, the smoke from a black powder gun, but luckily we had high-speed cameras set up, and the high-speed cameras, we can uh, figure out the muzzle velocity. You can measure it and figure out what your muzzle velocity is on the musket balls. And we published our first report, which we did for free. We put it out for archaeologists to use, historians to understand flintlock firearms. Uh, we've just actually revised it, basically with some editing that I had missed the first time. Um, but we just got these back up online again. We ended up doing three of them. One we just did recently um, because we did a validation study, which you'll see some of in here, uh, for the bullet strikes that we see from April 19th. So this is a video, and I love this one because it shows um, how the flintlock system works. You see the flint striking what's called the hammer at the time, the sparks going into the pan of the gun. There's a little bit of powder in the pan, and there's a charge in uh, the barrel. Um, you can see it start to light up. This is just the powder in the pan. The gun hasn't gone off yet. A um, lot of flame. <laughs> you burn the eyelashes off when you when you shoot these things, and you have to wear safety glasses because it's it's there's a lot of flash. Um, but as that starts to die down, you're going to see the charge actually go off in the gun. This was for a study we were doing on two musket balls that survived from the Boston massacre, and see it go off. See the flame shoot out of the vent. That was with two balls loaded in the gun. So I did that three times and I had a hell of a bruise on my shoulder afterwards. But it's a great video um, of how the lock functions. And here's the other end. Um, you can see that's firing. There's no ball that's come out yet. But in a couple seconds, you're going to see a flame um, come out of the bore and the ball is right behind it. There it is. Whoa. And the ball, you'll start to see it through the smoke with little bits of cartridge paper, and then you'll see the ball kind of travel across the screen. Um, and it's traveling about 835 feet per second. There is some um, variation, but there's the cartridge paper, and the ball is right behind it. There it is. And then you can see the ball passes the paper as the paper drops off. So it's important for us to understand you know, the muzzle velocities and how these things function when we look at uh, bullet strikes. So it's also important to understand the types of firearms that are being used. Uh, we're gonna start with the British here. Uh, I was talking with someone about a reproduction of one of these that they have, a British pattern 1769. That was the standard arm that was carried by light infantry companies that would have been on Lexington Green. Uh, the pattern 56, which is basically the same gun, but four inches longer, uh, a lot of the grenadiers, the grenadier companies um, who were marching behind the light infantry carried that gun. And they have a specific caliber ball they shoot out, but I hear people all the time say they're .75 caliber. Well, none of the originals are. We've sampled 80 original bores of guns that are in good condition, and they average about 78 caliber. They go from .76 to .82. So there's a lot of variation in the size of the bore, and that's because they were made from flat stock. They were made and they were welded. 
together. They weren't bored like a modern gun is today where you can be precise, and they didn't have to be. And here's a gun um, in the State House in Boston. This particular gun was captured from a grenadier uh, from the 43rd Regiment of Foot on April 19th in Lexington, right here. Um, he was marching behind the column, and supposedly the gun was carried by Captain Parker, or captured by Captain Parker, but it looks like it was Joshua Simmons um, who actually captured the gun and gave it to Parker that night. And he wrote an account of it, and he talked about this guy being a drunken grenadier. If you look, if you look on the barrel, you can see 43 and then REGT. So that identifies it as a gun carried by a guy from the 43rd Regiment. And we already know that the Grenadier Company was the only one who carried that pattern of gun. So as I was going through uh, documents at Mass Archives, um, I found a bunch of the prison uh, petitions from guys who were captured on the 19th. And there's two people from the 43rd, you can see on the bottom, right? You see Samuel Colton on the bottom, he was in the Light Infantry Company, so he didn't carry that gun. But Duncan McDonald was in the Grenadier Company, and he was the only Grenadier captured on the 19th. So that gun, more than likely, was the drunken Grenadier was Duncan McDonald. So I haven't let the state know this yet. This gun is hanging up in the state house. So at some point, I've got to give them the information, too, so that they can keep it with the gun. So musket balls that come out of the gun. A lot of people think, you know, it's a 75 caliber. It fires a 75 caliber ball. That's not true. Um, they needed something called windage. You needed to have space for the cartridge paper to be on the, on the ball, and as it fired, you didn't want the ball fouling and getting jammed in the gun. So normally, the, the rule of thumb is about .06 smaller than the bore or the ball would be. In the case of the British, um, it's 14 to the pound, which comes out to .693. So were they that accurate with their calculations and how the balls are going to be? No. This is um, part of a British musket ball study I did. This is a week and a half ago. I was up at Fort Ticonderoga. They have thousands of musket balls, all, all organized by caliber. Um, so I went up and I already had a sampling from the Parker's Revenge Project from Saratoga, two projects at Saratoga we did with veterans um, and a bunch of other sites. And then I added this data to it. So we have about 200 um, British musket balls that we've sampled in sizes. <coughs> And they range from 0.67 to 0.72. So why is this important? Because we're going to look at holes in wood and other objects. And we need to know what caliber the balls are. Uh, by the way, that particular ball uh, up in the upper right, um, that was pulled out of the Merritt Monroe House. And I'll be talking about that one in a few minutes. Then we get to the really hard part, is what were the provincials carrying? Um, you hear on presentations on Discovery and other channels, um, that both sides are carrying the same guns. That's not true. That's not true at all. The majority of the guns that are being carried by men on Captain Parker's company, um, any of the Concord companies, any of the other towns, is a fouling piece, which was made for hunting and sometimes adapted, like, like this example was. You can see in the bottom picture that it was adapted to fit a bayonet. Um, you can see the lug on the bottom of the barrel. Uh, that was made so that he could use it for hunting or for his militia use, he could pop a bayonet on the end of the barrel. Here's three more filing pieces with April 19th provenance. Uh, the top one, Framingham Minuteman Corporal Roger Brown uh, with a 0.60 uh, inch bore. Uh, the middle one is Captain Parker's filing piece, which the state also owns. That particular gun, the barrel's been shortened in the 19th century. Somebody cut it down to make it easier to hunt with. Um, that gun is 0.64 inch. And I can tell you that some of the musket balls that we found at Parker's Revenge would have been perfect for that gun. Uh, the bottom one has a very small bore, 0.50. Uh, that was carried by Samuel Dakin uh, from Lincoln, Mass. on April 19th. So the British also made comments on some of the guns that are being carried. Um, Frederick McKenzie, who was in the 23rd Regiment of Foot, who showed up on the relief, um, in his journal he mentions these fellows were generally good marksmen, and many of them used long guns made for duck shooting. Following piece. Here's another example from the newspapers, which you'll see I use a lot of newspapers in this. I spend a lot of time doing newspaper searches and find some great things. This one, besides the regular trained militia in New England, all the planter's sons and servants are taught to use the fouling piece from their youth and generally fire single balls with great exactness at fowl or beast. A gentleman well acquainted with that country is confident that four provinces can muster upwards of 12,000 of these marksmen in 48 hours. He wasn't that far off. So 
here he is. This, is, this was printed in England, then it got here by December of 1774, it was printed in the Boston papers. And the gun down below was Captain David Brown. Uh, he lived on the west side of the North Bridge and was in the second company in line. Uh, that gun also was adapted to fit a bayonet. You can see on the uh, end of the barrel. This is a gun that I didn't find out about until I was at Ticonderoga. Uh, it's one from their collection. It was carried by John Gordon from Stowe, Massachusetts. He marched on April 19th, although Stuart Stowe kind of came in behind the fight. Uh, but he was mortally wounded at Bunker Hill and died on the 19th of June. But this was a fantastic example of a parts gun. It was made from old French parts. It's an old French lock. The trigger guard butt plate are all French. Um, an imported barrel, and it was stocked in maple locally. Um, small bore on that gun too, 0.62. So it's the same bore as a fowling piece. Uh, but it's a fantastic gun. Had to include it. The other guns that are being used are old French arms from the French and Indian War. Uh, this particular newspaper article is Nathan Putnam from Danvers, Mass. Um, he was shot in the right shoulder and badly wounded, uh, diagonally across from the Jason Russell house by Cutter's Mill. And in the article, um, it says he lost a French fire alarm, Mark D, number six, with a marking iron on the breech. Um, it also states that um, the, they want it returned to the selectmen at Danvers. So Nathan Putnam probably took this gun and borrowed it from town stocks. Um, but it would have been a French 1728-41, um, and again, there were thousands of these that were captured during the French and Indian War, and they were for sale in newspapers all over the area. Um, probably one of the second or third most used guns by provincials on the 19th. Now, we get to King's Arms. Um, there were not a lot of King's Arms, military arms, that were here. The last shipment that came over was 1755, late 1755. Uh, they sent 2,000 pattern 42 muskets, which is uh, one of the ones down below here. Um, and those were for Massachusetts province stocks. So they weren't to be issued out, you know, you just, every man, man militia man went and grabbed one. You were supposed to show up armed and equipped as according to the law with your gun. If you didn't have one, then the state would lend you one or your town would lend you one. So these 2,000 were meant to be loaned. The problem was they issued them out in 56 for the Crown Point campaign and a bunch of them vanished. Soldiers took them home. So there were a spattering of these guns that would have been in the hands of provincial militias and minute companies on April 19th. The rest of them would have been in town stocks and stored in Worcester, um, or province stocks and stored in Worcester with the arms and bayonets that they had there. Uh, there were no muskets stored in Concord on the 19th. It was artillery and other provisions and such. So this is a great document that I found on the back of another document at Mass Archives. And it's the number of bullets to a pound each gun carries in Captain Turner's company. And if you look at the list, you can see the 14 ball per pound right over here that we we're talking about. So these would be about King's Arms bore. Um, and then all of these others are a lot smaller bore. They're fouling pieces. So you can really get an idea of how a company is armed at that time by this document. And this musket ball came from an archaeological dig I was on a year ago. Um, I can't say where it was yet. Um, we'll be publishing that hopefully this summer. Uh, but it's a 0.57 inch ball uh, from a fouling piece that was fired and dropped in soft dirt. And you can see that scraping or banding around the ball where it was fired. So you know, you, we find them sometimes and they look like they were just dropped. But when you look at them under magnification, you can see they were fired and just hit soft dirt when they reached terminal velocity. This one, however, you can see the banding where it had scraped the bore the of the gun and then just fell on the soft ground. So during a visit to the Jason Russell House in Arlington in uh, November of 2019, I went to look at some April 19th objects in their collection and I started looking at the bullet holes and I'd looked at them a million times. Um, but after doing all the shooting and study, we started looking at the bullet holes and going, well, if it went through here, it had to go here. And we ended up finding all these other bullet holes that nobody ever knew about. And so we decided we were going to put together a study. And it was going to start with just the Jason Russell House and end there. But then we decided we were going to do all of them that we could find. So it, it grew exponentially. But what were the goals? What were we going to do with this info? And obviously, we decided to publish a book with um, a lot of information. And there's a lot more than, than is in this talk. Uh, but we wanted to share information with archaeologists. Um, sites like Lexington Historical Society with their objects, 
uh, the Minuteman National Park with what they have Acton uh, and so on so that they could understand what they had a little bit better. Um, and we're going to use different types of methodology, continuing on with study of existing objects, um, archives. Uh, the most important on this list is shooting incident reconstruction. And shooting incident reconstruction is something that modern forensic uh, technicians use to study if somebody's been shot, they go into a house with ballistics rods, lasers, and set up exactly what happened. And turns out the person who wrote this book, uh, Lucian Haig, is buddies with Doug Scott. And we were able to talk to him a little bit, and I read his book. And there's some great things in here that we could do to better understand the historic bullet strikes, as opposed to, you know, modern jacketed rounds that go through somebody's house in a, in a bad incident. So we decided um, with the study, we're going to do all of them. So we started with the Elisha Jones house in Concord. Uh, British were light infantry were at the North Bridge. After the fight, they retreated uh, by the Elisha Jones house. <clears throat> now on April 19th, this section here was a shed that was off to the left of the property. And the British soldiers supposedly fired on it. In 1865, that shed was attached to the house and this carriage house built. So George Judge Kyes, who lived there, um, he had a little bowling alley set up for his kids upstairs. Um, but he was, the bullet hole was important to Judge Kyes. And in all of his writings, he, everything mentions the bullet hole. And here's uh, 1934 Margaret Thornton, uh, Concordian, going to visit it. I found this picture on Digital Commonwealth and I absolutely love it. There's a couple in this series of her um, studying the musket ball or musket hole, and here it is today, a uh, piece of plexiglass in front of it. So we had to go with the, the whole data that uh, the Park Service got from their architectural historians of 0.70, uh, which is consistent with British musket ball. You can see on the inside, um, it went through with that stud right here. It was added in 1865, and Judge Kais chiseled it out so you could see the bullet hole. So the stud has nothing to do with the bullet hole. You can see it's feather edge sheathing. You can see the white arrow where it's uh, situated the way it's supposed to be, the feather edge. And then you can see the yellow arrow arrows where the bullet went through and blew out uh, some of that feather edge sheathing. So we tested that. Um, here's a 69 caliber ball hitting 18th century wood. We had these house sections made with original materials. And you can see the back. You can see the lower hole. Um, where it blew out the feather edge. It was, happened to be a knot nearby, so it was a little harder. It blew out a little more wood. We were able to validate um, what we saw in the Elijah Jones house. Uh, as the British retreated, they were attacked at Marion's Corner, um, and then they came down to the Fisk Hill site, which I'm sure you guys know where that is. Um, James Hayward from Acton, he had marched that morning, had been at the North Bridge fight. Uh, he stopped to get a drink of water at the well, and there's a lot of 19th century Early 20th century accounts would say they had conversations, don't know anything about that. The only period account is in the newspapers, uh, April 25th, that says Mr. James Howard and one of the regulars discharged their pieces at the same instant and each killed the other. But Rebecca Fisk, who lived in the house, she had gone out of the house to take her father-in-law, Benjamin Fisk, to safety and she came back and she wrote about it in 1827. And she talked about one British soldier she found dead on the front steps, which is the one that James Hayward had shot. There were two wounded inside the house, and the third was a young American, employing his dying breath and prayer. A bullet had passed through his body, taking off in its course the lower part of his powder horn. The name of this youthful patriot was J. Haywood, Hayward of Acton. His father came and carried his body home. It now lies in Acton Graveyard. So in the 1980s, I knew there was a portrait of Rebecca Fisk that survived. It was sold at auction. And we couldn't see what was in the upper corner of it. Uh, but a month ago, the painting came up for auction again. And uh, there were some parties that I knew bidding on it. And luckily, uh, Old Sturbridge Village was one of them, and they bought it. And up in the corner, this event was so important to her. This is just before she passed away in the early 1830s, was the James Hayward incident with a British soldier shooting at each other, and you can see a well uh, nearby. And here's James Hayward's powder horn. It's in the Acton Memorial Library. Um, the hole is .70, consistent with a British musket ball. Um, it went through almost perfectly round and didn't come out that way. 
Um, it blew the original plug up. The plug that's on there now, the wooden plug with the silver bands, was put on by Stevens Hayward, who was James Hayward's nephew, but he ended up with a horn and it was passed down through his family until uh, donated to the Acton Library. And here, we tested this. And it was awful. Um, look at that block of gel jump. You just imagine how horrific that wound was. We had uh, layers of 18th century uh, replica cloth in front of it, uh, so we could see what happened um, after we cut into the gelatin. You can see there's a few fragments in there. And this is what we pulled out of the gelatin. The musket ball split when it went through the horn, but it carried all those bits of cloth and bits of horn into the body. So if Hayward had survived that, that wound, he probably wouldn't have survived for long. Um, he, he would have ended up with some sepsis or something from all the material jammed in his body. Horrible. But it doesn't end there. Um, the pump that Hayward was supposedly getting a drink from. Um, I had this book for published privately in 1912 by the descendants of Hayward, and it showed the Fisk house um, with the Hayward pump. And about 12 years ago, I was um, at Lexington Historical Society at the Hancock Clark House, or the Clark House in the barn, um, with Bill Poole, who was one of the members of the Lexington Men. We were moving some stuff around, and I found the pump up on one of the shelves. So we pulled it out of the barn, and eventually it, it got some conservation work done to it. And I was giving a presentation at Colonial Williamsburg, and the president, CEO, and some of the curators of the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia were there. And they saw the pump, and they saw the pictures of the horn. So they borrowed both of the items and put them together for the first time since April 19th in their April 19th display at the museum. Uh, the pump is now back home in Lexington, and the horn is back home in Acton. Uh, but it was nice to have them there for a few years where the world could see them. And like a lot of the people, they put in petitions for their losses. Uh, this is Benjamin Fisk's. Um, and he mentions all the things that were taken out of his house by the British um, and some of the damage. One sash window got smashed. That changes as the fighting goes on. The next house is right down the road from here, the Merritt Monroe House. And you can see it in this uh, detail from Amos Doolittle's Plate 1 of the British marching off towards Concord. And here's the house today. Uh, it's had some additions on it since 1775, obviously. And a shot was fired from the backyard that went up and lodged itself into the rafter in the house. And some work was being done, and they boxed in everything else except the rafter. And you can see right here, um, there was a round ball there that was filled in with plaster. And you can see a little area right here where it looked like something gouged it out. And here's the ball that was gouged out. This is in the Acton, uh, sorry, the, the Lexington Historical Society. And you can see the little gouge mark from whatever tool they used to pull it out of the beam and remnants of the wood uh, that are still stuck in the ball. And doing a newspaper search, I found this. Where it said, inside, the workmen found two bullet holes, one on the right of the front door and the other in the roof. In the latter case, the bullet was traced to where it had embedded itself in the heavy timber Apparently, both shots were fired in the Battle of Lexington. Bullet holes have been found in the Buckroom Tavern, I don't know where they get that from, on the other side of the Battle Green, but it was not until yesterday that it was known that the Monroe House had been hit. So I found this after I looked at the beam and the musket ball, so we were able to figure out that the musket ball probably was pried out in 1915. And again, Merritt Monroe had losses that he put in for, um, not as much as the others, um, but there's a lot more coming. So then we have Buckram, or Buckman Tavern. Um, Buckram, here I go, now I'm gonna keep saying it. Uh, Buck, Buckman Tavern had more bullet holes than uh, we know about now. Some of them were covered over. Um, and the majority of these holes, probably all of them, came during the British retreat. This is about the point where Lord Percy shows up, um, and the troops are getting desperate. Um, and they're shooting at any, any of the windows, any of the structures where people might be. Um, a shot from, was fired from about where I was standing, when I took this picture and hit the front door, you can see the ballistics rod in the bottom of the door at an angle. And then here's where the ball exited with typical wood blowout. And you can see where there's remnants of plaster where just to make the door functional again to keep the breeze out, they just plaster the hole shut. 
And I found this newspaper search, Reverend Caleb Stetson, he married um, a woman whose family owned the house, the Marion family, and so it became his, because that's the way it was at the time. Um, but it mentions um, clapboards around uh, the house that have a bullet hole in it. And so I reached back out to Lexington Historical and I said, oh yeah, we have a piece of clapboard from, from Buckman Tavern with a British musket ball hole in it. So this is a little wordy uh, here, but uh, Reverend William Gordon, um, he came out here the day after the battle or a few days after the battle, and he talked about it in his history of, of what happened, but a little this side of the Lexington Meeting House where they were met by the brigade with cannon under Lord Percy, the scene changed, and that's important. The fighting as if it wasn't bad enough uh, got even worse and heavier, and the British were burning houses, burning structures, and killing indiscriminately. Uh, they were not happy. And here's Lord Percy, a friend of mine who owns this great mezzotint from 1777, to put a face with the name. Uh, looks very British, doesn't he? And back to Amos Doolittle, uh, this wonderful, wonderful plate four, which is basically from uh, Woburn Street, looking towards uh, Monroe School, the old Monroe School on the hill. You can see the cannon. And here's Percy and uh, Smith meeting up. And you can see the destruction that was going on around them, that the, the relief force under Percy was lighting all these structures on fire so they couldn't be shot at, and troops were um, spread out so that they could get Smith's column in without uh, too much trouble. So the house that's not shown is Monroe Tavern in the Doolittle, and a shot was fired at the house. It may have come in the window, and hit the plaster ceiling in the tap room. It didn't go straight up through because it would have blown through the uh, floor and the ceiling above, and there's no damage from it. So it must have come in at an angle. Uh, this portrait of William Monroe is fantastic. This is attributed to artist John Greenwood. Um, it has all of the characteristics of his work. Um, William Monroe, father of Sergeant William Monroe, uh, died in 1747. He wasn't alive at the time of April 19th, but this portrait was hanging in the tavern, and he was shot also on April 19th. Uh, you can see the bullet hole right through his cuff. Uh, they did a horrible job restoring the painting, which is fantastic, because it would have covered up the musket ball hole. We might not even know about it. Um, it comes out at 0.71. Obviously, it's in canvas, so it may have stretched a little bit, uh, but it's definitely consistent with the British musket ball. And uh, William Monroe had a lot of damage to the tavern, a lot of things taken. Um, and again, this is from his uh, loss petition from Massachusetts Archives. So a friend of mine has a letter um, that is from an unidentified British officer from the 4th Regiment of Foot. And the letter's about four pages long, and it's fantastic. He was on Percy's relief. And he says, from eagerness, you would see a party of soldiers firing at the front of a house and another on its rear, whilst the main body were pelting away at the upper windows, by which means many of our own people fell, even after they were in the house and all the world could not prevent it. So they're actually shooting some of their own men that are in the houses, uh, that they're basically trying to rout out any provincials that are in there, killing any provincials that are in there, and then the British in the, on the main body of the road are shooting at the house, so they're, it's, it's, a whole me, it's a total mess. He also wrote, in one of those sallies, I had a very narrow escape, having a grenadier of the fifth, a soldier of ours and a marine, killed all around me. But we soon got into the house and I counted 11 Yankees dead in it, in the orchard. One villain had 73 balls in his bag and two horns of powder. I don't know how he had time to count all that. Um, the bodies would have been a lot easier, obviously. But the house he's talking about is the Jason Russell House in Arlington. Um, he got into the Jason Russell House, and it's the only description from somebody who was there. Uh, Amos Farnsworth from Groton. Um, he marched in Colonel Prescott's regiment uh, once they received the alarm, but they never made it to the fight. They came through after the fighting had passed. And he wrote, he came to Lexington, where much hurt was done to the houses there by breaking glass and burning many houses. But they was forced to retreat though they was more numerous than we. And I saw many dead regulars by the way. And then he says he went into a house where blood was half over his shoes. They had brought 12 dead men into the kitchen of the Jason Russell house. And he was inside, he saw the dead men in the Jason Russell house. And there's an account that supposedly comes from Jason Russell's wife who said the blood was ankle deep, but there's no actual, 
she never wrote it, it's just been word of mouth, and, and it turns out that it was more than likely Amos Farnsworth that that came from. So now we're gonna to get to the Jason Russell house. Um, you can see to the right was, is where Mass Ave is, uh, where the main body would have been marching. Um, as the flanking troops are going around the house and inside the house, and downstairs in the parlor on the north side of the house, the Mass Ave side, uh, there's a shot that probably came through the window. Um, it hit the wooden panel. It went through plaster wall and it struck the newel post and skipped out. You can see where it, you know, it skipped off the oak post. And here's an endoscope of that hole. You can see how it goes from fairly round and changes to football shape. So when it hit the post, you can see why it gouged it out the way it did. So we had to shoot it, we had to try it. So we shot um, 18th century paneling with original 18th century lath and plaster to see what it did. You can see the round hole, which is 0.69. And then it blew out in this weird oval on the plaster. Now the lath and plaster in the Jason Russell house was uh, replaced probably in the 19th or 20th century. Uh, at the time, they probably just filled over with more plaster. Upstairs above that, there's another shot that came from the parlor, or came through a window. You can see that yellow post-it. The laser brought it right up to Mass Ave, so it was from the main body that shot came from, went through the window, and then on the other side of the paneling was the secret closet. And I was a little too Rubenesque to get up inside, um, but luckily Mary Jane Balicki, one of our archeologist colleagues, was able to get up in there. And she could see it, pardon the fuzzy photo, but she was jammed up inside there. You can see the hole in the wood blow out, but she could also see where it reached its terminal velocity and hit the sterizer from the attic and dropped down. We did a lead test on this and it tested positive because it had been untouched. Nobody had ever seen it before, so it stayed, lead residue stayed on it. Another shot was fired outside the kitchen um, towards the window. Um, it went through the wall, and you can see here on the right is Sarah Lundberg, who's the director of the Arlington Historical Society. And you can see the laser beam, uh, which is right above the hole. The laser beam is on a, on a ballistics rod across the room where the ball went next. So when we put the ballistics rod in with the laser, it went right back down to where it came through the wall. And they plastered it, like all the other holes. Here's where it went across the room, went through the panel, and then it skipped off the ceiling. Um, there were some guys from Beverly who had come into the house and gone down into the basement, and the British were trying to get at them, and they started shooting through the door. Um, so there's one that goes through the door jam. The door was replaced in 1895, so it's not the original door, sadly. Um, but on the inside of the door jam, we could see where one of the bullet holes went through, hit the stairizer, and another one went through the stairizer and a backboard. And here's where they both came through um, the stair risers and would have gone into that plaster wall on the other side. Up in the attic, uh, again, they're shooting at windows. Um, this is just below the north side window. There's two bullet holes that go through there. Um, there's a newel post um, upstairs where a British soldier had fired, um, hit the post right here. It's filled with plaster. Um, at first, when I saw it, it's so dark, I thought it was another peg from the handrail, but it's not. And it almost came through the other side, and they, they must have pried it out. It didn't hit the wall on the other side and filled it with plaster. And so we know that all, a lot of the stuff in the house was filled. So we decided to get some 3D laser scanning of the house and the site done, um, which we can use for different things. But luckily, uh, Feldman Geospatial is a big uh, 3D firm. Um, one of the vice president's wife was the one who ran the Ar uh, Parker's Revenge Project. So she was able to get us um, this work done pro bono. And you can see some of these cutaways are really cool. You can see even up in the attic, the sheathing that was replaced and what was original by the color change. But it also enabled us to put this trajectory analysis together. So you can see all the white lines. Uh, those are all shots that we, we found in the house. Um, you can see all the different shots going in where they came from. 
there was a question, was the Jason Russell House moved? And there's a bunch of people, every talk I give, yes, it was moved. Well, based upon what? It was just moved. Okay, well, we're gonna figure that out. So we did an analysis of the uh, mortar and the foundation, it's 18th century. Up at the top, there's 19th or 20th century mortar with Portland in it, but everything below that is original. We also played with some new technology, um, running ground penetrating radar um, through the house to see what we could see on the other side. Kind of cool stuff. We got this pro bono also. And they put together a report and it states uh, that their analysis revealed no evidence that the Jason Russell house was relocated to its current location. Now this is important for the ballistics we're talking about, where the shots came from. If the house is moved, then that changes all of that. But their analysis showed that there were no other spots where the house was moved from um, on the property. But there is one thing that states uh, Russell Teal at his death in 1896, the house passed out of the family and a subsequent owner moved it partly off its original foundations to install a furnace. So he picked the house up, put a furnace in it, replaced the fireplace and put it back down. So that's the moving of the house. So, and I still will have people say, nope, don't believe it. Oh, all right, whatever. Um, and then there are loose relics that survive. Um, this is a great daguerreotype from the Captain William Adams house, which was just to the east of Jason Russell house on the left-hand side, headed towards Boston. Um, you can see the house next to the really cool, scary tree. That house was shot up on April 19th, 19th also. Um, quite a number of bullets have been found embedded in the walls and timbers many of which present flattened and ragged surfaces made by penetrating the, the oak timbers. The owner of the estate, Mr. Josiah Russell, takes pains to secure every bullet found in the building and disposes of them at the rate of $1 each. That's a lot of money in 1855. Yesterday afternoon, a small piece of clapboard which had been perforated by a bullet was sold for 50 cents. And here's a piece of board. Um, that was sold from the from the Adams House um, in the collection of the Arlington Historical Society. There's also a front door panel that survives um, and a great newspaper article, an old, old house in Cambridge known as the Old Adams House, and which received a peppering by the British on their way to Lexington in 1775, was recently pulled down, and some 20 bullets, which were found embedded in the woods, sold quick for one dollar each. Um, 1855, they started to take the house down for a train station, um, didn't take all of it, but part of it came down, and Mr. Josiah Russell was selling everything he could, any bullet hole, any bullet struck piece of wood he was selling, um, and including one of the door panels. You can see this .60 um, bullet hole in the panel, um, and on the there's a note with it that says it was pierced by a British bullet. Uh, this is probably from a provincial fouling piece, some overshot uh, that went through the door. Another great uh, period image of the the Adams House, um, which is tacked to it. And here's one of the bullets that was sold. Um, they have just pulled down the old building at the corner, which is full of bullets from both sides. They split up the boards and sold the bullets for, for a dollar each. On the northwest side, of course, the bullets were those of the advancing Americans. On the south side, the retreating English. So you could buy a Wigger Tory bullet. So this particular ball came out of the Adams House it's fairly mangled, but by weighing it, we can tell what the actual caliber was, although it might have had a little bit of loss. A .63, um, so it was probably an American ball, or a provincial ball. Um, the other thing, like we mentioned, the British were shooting at the windows and shooting at shutters um, on the other side of the windows. Um, and so there are some shutters that survive. Uh, the houses on the road of the march of the British were all perforated with balls and the windows broken. Um, here's a shutter from Arlington. Um, was taken from the Amos Whittemore house. Amos Whittemore didn't live there in 1775, um, but a guy named uh, Bradish, Ebenezer Bradish, did. Um, and the house, his wife left an account of the house being completely shot up. Um, that shutter came out of there. This one we don't know. Um, we stopped a moment at the old Whittemore house in West Cambridge to see the memorable bullet holes in the shutters there. Not a penny weight less than the legitimate ounce bullet must those balls have been. And when you measure the holes, that's true. Um, that's definitely a British musket ball hole, and you can see the entrance and the exit. But when we studied the shutter, we found another three that had been plastered, closed, which we didn't see initially. Um, but they plastered all the holes, and then the original hole in it had been plastered at 1.2. So we had to shoot it. 
So I took a original shutter that we had and we shot it five times um, with a 69 caliber ball to see if we could replicate some of the damage. Now you gotta remember it's a smooth bore gun, so it's not as easy to hit what you're pointing at. So the fact that we were able to hit a powder horn and hit some of these other things is amazing. We were trying to shoot at certain areas, but sometimes they, you know, you can't hit the same spot you're, you're shooting for with those guns. Um, here's the entrance holes and the exit holes, at least for two of the shots. Now there's some missing bullet struck objects. Uh, the door from the cellar in the kitchen of the Jason Russell house was taken out in 1895, and it was thought that it went to Chelsea or Charlestown. Um, they put it, this ad in the newspaper in 1925 trying to figure out where it was um, and so far nobody's found it. We don't know whether it survives anymore. But it says, according to the newspaper article, it was shot full of bullet holes by the British and it was during this, the time that repairs were made upon the house that it was taken away and replaced by, the new, by a new door, which is the one that's there now. So hopefully at some point we can track that down. Uh, back to Merritt Monroe, um, he had a chest on chest um, in the house. To the west of the common is the Monroe house built in 1728. A bullet passed through the glass over the door and embedded itself in a bureau. The bureau bullet and all is in the possession of one of Monroe's descendants in Chicopee, Mass. So I reached out to the Chicopee Historical Society and I reached out to all the online descendants of Merritt Monroe. They even mentioned this chest on chest on their website and nobody knows where it is. Another one from Lexington. And this is a cool one. We've, I found this newspaper article um, before I knew about the second part of the story. Um, and it's basically talking about a window shutter supposed to contain the perforation of the first musket ball fired in the contest was taken from Buckman Tavern in Lexington. Um, first shot of the contest, probably not. Um, but it probably was shot during the British retreat um, when Buckman Tavern was surrounded. But I was doing some work at Lexington Historical Society and Stacy Frazier, who was a curator at the time, said, oh, you gotta look at this manuscript that she has from Levi Harrington, who was there. And Levi Harrington mentions this newspaper article and there was a clipping in his journal. It says, a notice appeared in the newspaper in the year 1845, stating that a shutter perforated by a ball taken by a gentleman from Buckman's Tavern soon after the war was in Scotland. And that if the circumstance could be authenticated, it would be a valuable relic. The understanding distinctly remembers that a man came here and took away a shutter from Buckman's Tavern. It was on the small shop attached to the house, and he has no doubt that this is the same shutter referred to by the newspaper. So Levi Harrington supposedly saw that shutter come out. We reached out to all the museums in Glasgow and archaeologists that we knew in Glasgow to see if they could find it, and so far we haven't found it. Um, Reuben Kennison, he was killed um, on the Jason Russell property, and his body was brought back to um, Beverly, and his shirt survived. His, his wife kept the shirt that he was wearing with a bullet hole in it, supposedly. It was passed down through the family and donated to the Beverly Historical Society in the late 19th century. So I reached out to them, and they said all they have in their records is that it was um, taken out of collection about 1920. And I remembered I had heard about this shirt fragment at Danvers, and it turns out Kennison, where he lived at the time, was Beverly, but then it became part of Danvers. So Danvers ended up with a shirt fragment, and they even mentioned it in 1975 that they were studying it. They can't find it. They didn't know what I was talking about, even though I sent them stuff from their own book. So hopefully um, we can find this shirt fragment, and we tested shot linen um, to see what we could, you know, to see what it would look like, what it did. Um, Samuel Shedd's chest on chest. Um, the only reason I knew about this was because of Frank Warren Coburn, who wrote um, The Battle of April 19th. He was a Lexington resident. Um, and he mentioned um, a little farther along the northerly side of the road stood the home of Samuel Shedd. Percy's troops halted there for a few moments necessary to turn his field piece on his pursuers. While there, one of the Britons, ambitious for plunder, entered the Shedd home and finding there a bureau or high boy filled with household effects commenced the work of selecting what he desired. It took him too long for his companions passed on and left him too busy to notice their departure or the coming of Americans. Bullets came through the window, one of which killed him and three riddled the old bureau, spattering his blood over it and the floor. The old high boy was in existence in 1910 and treasured by a Somerville man, Francis Tufts, to whom it descended. I have seen it with its blood stains and three bullet holes. So I reached out to Somerville Historical Society. They told me it exists. 
They contacted the owner. They got back to me and said it was during COVID. Um, how about six months from now? I contacted the back and I can never get any responses. So this is still out there. We weren't able to put it in the book and I really wanted to see it. Um, but hopefully down the road, once it gets published, we can get into it. I'm assuming that it's owned by the Tufts family um, and maybe in their collection. So we'll see. And so to end, I'm going to end with a poem, and my wife likes to watch really stupid things on TV. So when she's watching dumb shows, I'm doing 18th century newspaper searches, and I found this great poem. And I was hoping Paul O'Shaughnessy from the 10th Regiment would be here so I could dedicate it to him. Um, but it's called The Irishman's Epistle to the Officers and Troops at Boston. And it was in the Essex Journal, December 8, 1775. By my faith, but I think you're all makers of bulls, with your brains and your breeches, your guts and your skulls. Get home with your muskets and put up your swords and look in your books for the meaning of words. You see now, my honeys, how much you're mistaken, for conquered by discord can never be beaten. How brave you went out with your musket, muskets all bright and thought to befrighten the folks with the sight. But when you got there, how they powdered your pums and all the way home, how they peppered your bums. <laughs> and it's not, my honeys, a comical farce to be shot in the face or to be proud of the face and be shot in the arse. <laughs> they didn't actually put that, as you can see. To be after their firelocks, or sorry, how come you to think they did not know how to be after their firelocks as smartly as you? Why you see now, my honeys, there's nothing at all but to pull at the trigger and pop goes the ball. And what have you got now by all your designing but a town without victuals to sit down and dine in and to look on the ground like a parcel of noodles and sing how the Yankees have beaten the noodles? I'm sure if you're wise, you'll make peace for a dinner, for fighting and fasting will soon make you thinner. So obviously the British uh, were stuck in Boston after the 19th with no way to get food, and this whoever wrote this decided they make fun of them. So thank you. Hopefully uh, you didn't sleep too long. You know, appreciate you guys actually coming out. <laughs> Oh, there's a yeah. question. Oh, I hope so. This one right there? Yeah. He's, he's right All there. right. So um, the way we do Q&A, you wait for the mic because we want to immortalize your voice on the record. Phil, you go first. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm remembering the beginning of your talk, and we saw a bullet come out of the gun and go across the landscape yeah. There's a tree on the right. What is the, set, the time duration that we're looking at? So we can set the camera at however many frames a minute we want. I think that was 3,800 frames a minute. When we did it the last time, we ended up setting it a little bit faster, and we should have slowed it down so you could see the ball more. But it's actually, you know, 835 feet per second. It's flying by. When I was in the service, they mentioned that uh, when you fire a bullet, it'll hit the ground just at the same time as if you dropped a golf ball. And the gravity of the fact that it goes a distance means nothing. It still will drop at the same rate. And they do drop. And sometimes, like I mentioned, like at Parker's Revenge, we found. I remember the day distinctly when we hadn't found any musket balls for a while on the second, no, third week. And all of a sudden we started to find musket balls in the soft ground where they had just dropped. And after picking them up, I thought that they were dropped, but when we started to clean them up, we could tell they had been fired by Parker's men and they just dropped. And hit the the soft last ground. thing I got is a caliber. What does a caliber mean? It's a percentage of an inch of a percentage. So, yeah, so 0.69 inch. You know, is is what it is. So you know, you look at a musket, you know, or a bullet today, thirty caliber, you know, point three zero. Um, these are, for the most part, a heck of a lot bigger. And I can tell you that when they hit, we've done some other tests. Um, there was one guy, John Robbins, who was shot, um, wounded on the green, and I found all of his petitions from his wounds and how he was hit. And we actually replicated that shot with a ballistics gel and head um, bust with skeletal uh, parts of the skull, spine and everything, and we replicated the shot and it was horrific. So those 69 caliber balls, I think going as slow as they do, because they're slow compared to a modern bullet, like you would have fired in the military, um, it causes a lot of damage. 
just awful. Uh, we have a question from Zoom from Jim Ramsey. Um, where did the Minutemen get their ammo and did they have to pay for it? So each Minute or militia man had to supply his own arms and ammunition. Now, that being said, there are guys, at least I know from Concord, some of the other towns, who are paying the town for powder and they're buying some of the musket balls. So they're paying for their own. They had to show up with all of their stuff. They weren't getting it issued out to them for the most part. Even in Sudbury, there's a record of who got powder and who got shot, and it has a price next to it. Now, after the war begins, then some of that stuff gets put into the state to be paid for. Um, and after that, once they join, um, and they're actually in continental service, they're being issued cartridges. Uh, but on April 19th, they had to bring their own. Do you know if the um, men that fired the, the bullets had a lot of eye, eye damage? There's no record of what happened to them. I'm assuming they probably did and had a lot of ear damage. I can tell you from shooting uh, my whole life, uh, being on a cannon crew, going to rock concerts, my hearing is going, and I'm losing my eyesight too, and I've done a lot of black powder shooting, so. Did um, the British soldiers, the, the regulars, the regulars in the British Army, mm -hmm. did they have a lot of basic training in firearms before they came? So, there was no basic training like you guys had when you were in the service. Um, they joined, they were trained by sergeants, you know, to do what they had to do. They were doing firing at marks. There's a lot of accounts of um, units firing on Boston Common um, and getting live fire training um, before they actually went into combat. As far as, you know, there were some officers who had a lot more training and such than some of the enlisted men. Um, but they had a little bit. They had a little bit of live fire training, and obviously they were drilling quite a bit because that's all they had to do in Boston at the time. I, I also heard that uh, if you were a regular a grunt in the army, you, you lost your weapon. There was a price to be paid for that. Oh, yeah. Well, in the British Army, you're being issued the gun. Provincial companies, and even after the war starts, again, you're supposed to bring your own gun. You get paid for that. You get paid for the use of your gun. Or if you don't have one, you can get one out of your town stocks that you're responsible for. And, or you could get one out of province stocks, or continental stores during the war. But you're responsible for it and you have to pay for it if something happens to it. So there are some guys who got charged um, for guns after April 19th when they had a town or province arm and then petitioned um, saying, hey, I lost this in battle. I shouldn't have to pay for it. And sometimes they didn't have to. But if it was lost, Maliciously, there's a lot of guys who lost guns. French and any war, I have probably 50, 60 petitions for guys who had lost their guns. And they're petitioning to the states, and no, I want my money. I shouldn't have to pay for that gun. But they lost their gun. How many Americans were killed? Well, there's there's numbers out there on the actual casualties on both sides. I think it changes as the days go on. I think there's 49 Americans. Um, but you also have guys who were mortally wounded, who die later. Um, so the numbers are a little bit, maybe a little bit off, but 49. I'm just curious, um, during, you said you did some work on the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Did the technology change that much? Oh, that's a good question. Yes, it did. So during the Civil War, they're still using some smoothbore guns, some even flintlocks, but they've moved to the percussion ignition system, which is better than the flint. But you end up now with rifled guns, a lot more rifled guns. So the standard arm of the Civil War is an 1861 Springfield, which is a 58 caliber gun that's rifled. So you can hit a target. Um, at a greater range with greater accuracy than you can with any of the smoothbore stuff. So yeah, it, it had changed a lot, but what didn't change was a lot of the tactics. So you've got masses of men fighting in the same way they were fighting here, but with rifled guns. So you end up with a lot more casualties. Thank you. Uh, question on uh, 
much to conk it if i remember correctly the british wanted to secure an armory in conk it and what was in that armory who owned it so that's another good question because a lot of people don't understand this when the british marched out to concord they were going after provincial stores that were paid for by the provincial congress so when they took control in october and november of 1774 they said that all of the taxes were not going to be paid to the king anymore and the king's tax collectors it was going to the provincial congress so they took that money and they started to buy stores artillery provisions linen all sorts of things medical kits everything they needed and they stored them in concord uh, worcester uh, a bunch of other towns and they would move them around a little bit because they knew at some point the british were going to come after them but those were all purchased by the province. So they weren't for use. The militias weren't going to conquer to get supplies before April 19th out of those stores. Those were for provincial use when the war broke out. Mm -hmm. So after the war breaks out, all of those supplies start to get shipped into the siege of Boston. So there's ammunition, there's musket balls, cases of them stored in stow. There's some in Concord. There's um, musket balls that are stored in the center of Concord that, that get thrown into the mill pond. Some of them still survive. Um, but the list of stores survived. Um, the Provincial Congress on April 5th asked for a listing of where everything was. And the list of the supplies that were in Concord were all marked down by a guy named Captain Jonas Hayward, who worked with James Barrett. And those lists survived at the American Antiquarian Society. So I've gone through all those lists, and I found a list that nobody knew where it was um, at Mass Archives, which had the list of supplies and what towns they were in. Um, it was in a 1799 file at Mass Archives. There was no date on the document, so they didn't know what it was, so they just put it at the end. So I found the document, and I know it was April 5th, uh, because based upon the Provincial Congress. So there was a lot of material, a lot of stuff that they were buying and storing all around. But the muskets themselves that the province owned, and we don't know exactly how many. When the Provincial Congress took control, there was about 250 that were in, in province stores. That's not a lot of guns. All that stuff, it says on the list, it says small arms in Worcester, and that bottom of that page is missing. So all of the small arms were stored there. Now there were some muskets in Concord that were moved as the British got out there, but those were town stock of guns that were moved out. So it was mostly artillery provisions and other materials in Concord. Uh, you mentioned uh, Jason Russell House not being moved, mm -hmm. but it brought to mind, there was a house in Arlington that was a historic house, it was moving to the center, it's sitting in the center of Arlington. There were a few houses that were moved in Arlington to different locations. The Jason Russell house, they thought that it was moved within the property, yeah. but it wasn't. There were other houses, the Deacon jo Josiah Adams house right down the road. Part of that house was taken off and attached to another house. We just found out from a letter that was sent to the Arlington Historical Society that in the 40s there were bullet holes in it that they covered over. Yeah. Um, so sections of the houses were moved and reused, yeah. This one's the whole house, right in the center, right in the, the very center plot of Arlington, you know, where, where Mass Ave cross, uh, crosses Route 60. It's right there. Yeah, I know the house you're talking about. I think that is a little bit later. Really? Yeah, yeah, I don't think that's an April no 19th house. That What's that? No bullet holes in that one. No, no. And again, a lot of these houses that did have bullet holes in them, they've covered, they, they're long gone, our work's been done, and the sheathing's been replaced, so it's just, they're gone. Thanks very much. Yeah. Any more questions? Oh, yes, we do. Rich, just a moment. Thank you. Thank you. When the, uh, when the alarm went out, you can spread the alarm from every Middlesex village and farm, and many of the Minutemen came from quite a distance. Right. Uh, many of them did not make it. Right. I have I have many relatives who fought in the revolution. There were about this huge family in Topsfield, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. There were actually ten sons within that family that basically started on their way to Lexington, and a few relatives from out in the western part of the state. And one story was that one gentleman basically made all the taverns on the way towards Lexington, but never got got to Lexington itself. But when all of these uh, uh, Minutemen arrived and, you know, the battle was over and done with, did many of them stay in the yes. area or did they go back? So that was, they had figured on this, that when the alarm went out, you were going to get all the local guys that were going to make it to the fight. 
But it was important that all those others come in afterwards because that's what sealed the Boston, uh, the, the British in Boston. And that was the beginning of the siege of Boston. So you needed the guys from Topsfield and the guys from West Brookfield, you know, that came in a few days later. The guys from Connecticut that ended up coming up New Hampshire. You know, all these guys came in and sealed off the town. And some of them stayed for four days, some of them stayed for 30 days. But on April 23rd, they actually formed an army. Before that, there were militias within militia regiments, men companies within minute regiments, but they actually formed the Massachusetts Grand Army. And um, then people joined. So you see people that are there for four days, and then all of a sudden they're there again, but they're in an actual company that formed um, when the army actually formed itself. So, but those guys are important because there's a lot of people that say, well, God was from God, who cares? They didn't fight on April 19th. No, but he was one of the reinforcements that came in right afterwards that were extremely important to the siege of Boston and getting the bridge to leave Boston. I would love to have a follow-up question. I have always been fascinated with the communications network that existed in 1775. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have a telegraph. But something like 20,000 colonists assembled within what? 24 hours? Well, by what the heck? How did it work? How did they get so many people? What did <laughs> Yes, exactly. Tell us, tell but us they how had, it worked. So everybody's only heard of Paul Revere and William Goss. Yeah. There were a hell of a lot more riders than those two. And then they were prepared. They were preparing for this. They had an army of observation to watch what was going on, to know when the attack was going to come. And they had riders all set up. So there's a Facebook post I just saw the other day that um, the um, Sonic Museum in Lexington has one of the letters that was sent out um, before the Concord fight had even happened. They knew about Lexington, it's nine o'clock in the morning, and they're already sending runners going out um, to Connecticut and, and other colonies to spread the word um, to get these people to start marching. So all horseback, and there was a ton of these people. You know, I've seen some of the bills that people have put in for their riding. You know, it was, they were prepared for it. They were prepared to have riders to go out and spread the word. You know, and the fact that so many of these companies came in to the fight right where they needed to be is another thing. You know, you didn't, you know, you weren't calling each other on the radio, so you need to take a right, you need to show up here. There are riders out there that are telling these people where to go, and they're organized. They're falling into place right where they were needed for the most part. Wow. Yeah, it's more, April 19th, you know, people think of it, and I was talking about this with someone earlier, that there were a bunch of guys who were just farmers who grabbed the musket from over the fireplace and beat the British Army. That's not true. You know, these guys were, were planning and preparing for a long time. So they had some skills. They had been doing arm uh, manual of arms, marching. You know, they were armed and equipped. They were ready to go. So it was just a matter of time. That's huge. It is. There was a great letter from a friend of mine in California owns, same one that owns the, the British um, letter from an unknown officer. And it's from Jonathan Hosmer in Acton. And it's written on April 10th. And it basically states that he's been ill and everything, but a rider came to town and the British are coming. We just don't know when, but if they do, there's going to be bloody work. You know, this is April 10th. Nine days later, his son is killed at the North Bridge. Abner Hosmer. So, you know, they knew this was coming. It was just a matter of time. When, uh, when the main column of the regulars are traveling, say, on Mass Ave, mm -hmm. did, did they always have scouts on the flanks and an advance party? So, there's regular soldiers. They sent, they put the light infantry companies in the front so that when they got to Concord, they could hold the North Bridge and the South Bridge, so that nobody could come into town. So they had the light infantry in front. Now there has been current research by a guy who's actually in the Lexington Minutemen, Alex Kane, um, on some uh, loyalist guides who were provincials that were with the British column and probably were guiding them as to where to go. Now when they get up to Lexington, obviously there's the fight at the Green. They put the light infantry back out again. When they get to Concord, the Grenadiers march along the road and the light infantry goes up on the ridge to kind of flank the Grenadiers as they go into town. On the way out, obviously they are doing that because they're being fired at from everywhere. So there's flankers on either side of the column running around trying to push these people out. 
two questions. One is uh, down your line. Uh, how accurate were these uh, muskets? Okay. And That's make it a second question. Uh, some folks, according to some members of my own family, say the revolution really started to be organized at the Boston Massacre. Is that how those well, are linked together? There, well, you have the Stamp Act, the Boston Massacre. You know, all these things are happening. They're starting to get more and more agitated. It's really when Gage shuts down any members of the, the local uh, Congress from being at the meetings that they form their own provincial Congress. And that's when they start to buy all these supplies and prepare to break away. Um, that's all a part of it, for sure. You know, and I'm sure in 1770, that's when a lot of the agitators we were talking about earlier are starting to work their magic. You know, it's five, only five years after the massacre that April 19th happens. Uh, and your first question was accuracy of the guns. So smoothbore muskets that are being carried by British and provincial forces are not really accurate guns. They're meant for firing in mass, lots of lead going down range. However, we shot not for, your, for accuracy. We were trying to get muzzle velocities and stuff and damage. But what we found out through the, the fouling pieces, I have one that's got a 55 inch barrel and it's a 0.62 bore. So it's firing about a 58 caliber ball. And that gun at 100 yards was hitting the target every time. So the other ones were not. Sometimes we had a tarp set up in the back so that we could see where the balls were going because you're aiming, but the ball's going over here. Extremely hard to hit, but the fouling piece, which is what most of the provincials are carrying, is actually really accurate. It's also thin and not made for military use, so they break, but it was a heck of a lot more accurate than, than what we got out of the British arms, for sure. I will give a quick commercial. In um, October of this year, Professor Bob Allison, history professor at Suffolk University, is going to come here and talk to us. He's also the chair of Mass 250, the 250th anniversary for the state celebrating. Bob's a great guy too. He's wonderful. Yeah. And his talk, Roger, is going to be, I've forgotten the title of it, but it's the fact that the revolution did not begin in 1775, it began in 1773. And he's going to talk about all the things that led up to the revolution and that Massachusetts was fomenting years for a long time, yeah. 1775. So you you uh, you colored it. All right, I think Matt has a, a final wrap up question. Yeah, from the Zoom. Take it away. There Matt. was just um, one more. That was um, uh, what what is there more to learn, and do you have further research planned? So. There's, you know, there's the objects that I talked about that are missing. I have a feeling when the book comes out, there is going to be other things that pop up that we didn't know about. So what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, social media pages, and we're going to put in all the stuff that we couldn't use in the book, videos and things like that, as well as any new things that come up. Now, there's some bullet holes I know from the Siege of Austin um, that we want to talk about, but it didn't fit in this book. So we're going to continue to do stuff. And I can tell you right now, we're going to continue to do live fires until neither of us can do it anymore. So it's, it's just a lot of fun to understand these guns in a different way, you know, because a lot of people talk about, you know, uh, I don't think that could happen. I don't think this would happen. Well, they've never even fired a gun, let alone a musket. Yeah. So I, I enjoy learning more about it. So in some ways, it's not just about the book is great. That was an afterthought. We do this anyway. You know, we spent, this was all self-funded except for a grant we got for the last ballistics study of $3,500. So we've paid for everything else. And we didn't do it because we were trying to make any money or anything. We, we did it because we love doing it. So we're going to continue doing it. Can you repeat the name of your book for everyone? Yeah, and it's it's kind of a long title. Here's the title. Here's the cover. Um, you know, it obviously covers a lot more than just bullet strikes. Um, there's a whole chapter on the Arlington um, Cemetery where the, British, where the provincials were buried and the British mass grave that was there. And I actually 
was able to locate through GPR that we use, the guys who did the Jason Oswald, where the British mass graves are. So we know where the British soldiers are buried now um, that were buried on April 20th in Arlington. Um, and we're going to try and get a marker placed for them. Um, the town's been a little bit slow to kind of take up on that. Um, so I'm hoping that we can push that and raise some money and get a marker for those guys too. So that they're, you know, the, the provincials killed. You know, we know where the guys are in Lexington. There's a lot of British along the Battle Road who are buried. We don't know exactly where they are. We know where the provincials are in the Arlington Cemetery. They were exhumed in 1848 um, and reburied with the monument, and the British have just been kind of left there. So it'd be nice if we could do something for them, too. Yeah. All right. Please join me in giving Joe Lowe a warm round of applause. Thank you, Joe. Please come to Lexington if you're not already here a week from today, April 15, for the Patriots Day Parade. Two o'clock in the afternoon. Do you know there are going to be more than 90 marching units in the parade? It's big. So see you there. This concludes our presentation. We will see you next month on May 13. Hope to see you next week. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you again, Joe. Bye, everyone.